And a very good evening to you and welcome to Politics 101, David Ryan here. On a Thursday evening, uh, welcome you down to the show, whether you're joining us from Guyana or from the wider Caribbean, whether you're joining us from North America or Europe. Welcome to Politics 101, understand there's some snow there in New York. Um, be careful, those of you who are on the roadways. Uh, welcome. Welcome to all the regulars. Tonight, we expect Mark Benshop, Mark Benshop, to stop by to have our monthly chat um, uh, on the issues of the day. Uh, this week, of course, we're covering the budget and we're covering uh, the uh, Moko Arcadia issue, which is, for us, still a live issue. Um, for some people, it may be something that has come and gone, but for us, it is still a live issue. And Mark is going to be here and... Uh, when I last spoke with him, he was trying to make his way home. Um, but uh, he's going to join us, and we are going to be talking about the issues of the day um, that we are dealing with. The budget is out. And we had Elson Lowe last night giving us a sneak peek into uh, the budget. And of course, we have concluded that the budget is still a budget for friends and comrades. Large percent of the budget is for infrastructural development, as they say. And we know uh, that the infrastructure uh, sector, that's where a lot of the money is. And uh, that study that was commissioned by the Hughes showed us that the contracts, the contracts in that area, government contracts, um, that a lot of those contracts, the vast majority of those contracts are not given to African Guyanese. In fact, put another way, African Guyanese um, do not benefit from government contracts as much as other groups, minuscule, less than 10%. And so all of that money over a third of the budget um, uh, is in that sector. And so it's a lot of money going into the pockets. That's all you use a government to enrich sections of the population. I've argued on this program over and over again that no ethnic group in Guyana or anywhere in the world can tell you that they were able to accumulate wealth on their own. They've always been sponsored and they've always been sponsored by the government. It is the government, whether in the United States um, uh, or not, or anywhere in the world, when poor white men in the 1830s began to accumulate wealth. It was as a result of government lottery that gave Cherokee land, in native Indian land, to poor white men. And eventually government removed uh, the native Indians from the land in what was called the Indian Removal Act paving the way 
for poor white men to own property. And once you own property, you became a citizen. And so that's how poor white men became citizens because prior to that, only rich white men or white men who own property could be citizens. So the way poor white men became citizens in America, it was because government gave them property. Take away the property of the native Indians by law, by law, by law. President Andrew Jackson, by law, took away the lands from native Indians and give them to poor whites. And that's how poor whites were able to become citizens and were able to begin to accumulate wealth, what is known as the American dream. Because once you got that land, you then got slaves. And one or two turnover of cotton. And poor white men became rich white men. In our own Guyana, in our own Guyana. And Portuguese, Chinese, Indian, Guyanese came as part of the indenture scheme. The Portuguese and Chinese quickly proved not up to the task to work on the plantation. And they were then steered by government into commerce. They were given a formative action in commerce. And that's how they got into business. So when we look at Portuguese people very much into business, that it was a bit as a result of the colonial government in the 19th century, sponsoring them into business. We know that our Indian Guyanese brothers and sisters were given land adjacent in front of the sugar plantations. Our Amerindian brothers and sisters got land at independence. And so when you look at the landscape, you understand why African Guyanese are not dominant as the other ethnic groups in the commercial sector. All the others were given incentives to get into the commercial sector. African Guyanese who were the first entrepreneurs and private sector people because they bought land and turned them into villages and set up their village economy. They were the first entrepreneurs. They did it on their own. And the government, of course, found ways to stifle the black private sector. And then later on, encourage blacks to leave agriculture and go into the professions and the police and the army that started the colonial government. So policies are very important in terms of wealth as far as ethnic groups are concerned. I, I, I did mention yesterday that at the time of emancipation, the British passed, as part of the Emancipation Act, the British promised 48 million pounds to the slave owners as reparations. And they could only come up with 20 million pounds. This is 1834, eh? so it's a lot of money. They could only come up with 20 million. The other 28 million, the free people had to work for four years. It was stated that they would work for eight years and pay off that other 28 million. They were able to do it in four years. So African Guyanese and other Caribbean, because this is a, a Caribbean wide, 
and other Caribbean ex-slaves had to pay for the reparations that were given to these former slave masters. So that is money owed to African people, money owed to African people. Of course, there is money owed for the over 200 years of enslavement in which they received no wages. And then when they set up their own economy, the state, the colonial state moved to destroy their crops, etc. That's money owed to them. Accumulating, that money has been accumulating. And so African Guyanese are the only group that did not get government help to get into the private sector. We know the story. We know that when the PNC came to power in 1966, they did not. It was not part of their policy to create a, a black private sector. They spent a lot on education. They spent a lot on health care. Because these were things that were not spent on by the colonial government. And understandably, when the independence leaders came to power, those were the first things that they spent on. And uh, in Guyana, the government did not did not spend on the black private sector. That is to give blacks incentives to get into the private sector, to get into business. There were incentives to get into the army and the police and the public service, but not to get into business. One could see it as a critique of the independence leaders. One could say that their hands were tied, that it was imperative that they spend whatever little resources they had on critical areas such as education and health care and infrastructure and so on. Um, and today, we saw the PPP came back to power. In, first of all, when the PPP was in power in 57, 64, it invested tremendously in agriculture, where its supporters were, building up agriculture infrastructure, building agriculture scheme, the black, black bush polder scheme, et cetera, and investing a lot in agriculture. And when they came back to power in 1992, they went one step further. They invest a lot in the business sector where some where they people were already dominant and they also created new business people by giving them contracts people who were not skilled in road building became contractors 30 years later those people are there they're big business people and we have seen in all four of the budgets that the PPP has presented, the vast majority of those spendings are in that area of the economy that the people are dominant. This budget is no different. It's no different. That's how you funnel money to groups. That's how you funnel money to groups. All that, those billions of dollars that are being spent on infrastructure, those contracts to build those roads and buildings will go to the contractors who are there now. 
And this is what uh, Nigel Hughes found, that in those contracts, those contracts given by government, less than 10% of those contracts go to African Guyanese. For Amerindians, it's probably even less, well, not probably, definitely less. So that there are three ethnic groups that dominate that sector. Stones and quarry, we saw the same thing. So the budget is very important in terms of where the government is spending and who are benefiting from the government spending. Well, that's where Guyana is. That's where Guyana is. Good evening to you. We're waiting on Mark Benshop to join us. Um, and we're going to be talking uh, about the issues of the day. And whether you're joining us from Guyana, good evening to you. Good evening to those of you who are in the wider Caribbean. Um, Election in Antigua yesterday was closer than people thought it was going to be. And we know lots of Guyanese in Antigua. I know a uh, lot of Guyanese support the Labour Party. Um, but it was quite, quite an election there. Um, the Labour Party thought it was going to be uh, another almost landslide didn't turn out to be. And um, we are noticing more and more that people are expressing their anger at arrogant, arrogant government. Arrogant government. Good evening to you if you're joining us from Antigua. Those of you who are joining us from St. Kitts, good evening. How about our brothers and sisters in Barbados? Good evening to you. Uh, those of you in the Bahamas, good evening. Welcome to Politics 101. As I was coming, um, as I was leaving campus earlier, a friend of mine called, he's a supporter of the PPP and called to tell me that I must be balanced. I must give the government licks where the government deserve licks, and I must give them praise where they deserve praise. And um, Brother Richard, uh, he's a friend of Mark's too. In fact, it's Mark's classmate. And um, I told him I am going to try as hard as possible <laughs> to see what I can give the government praise for. I am looking to see something in the budget that I can give the government praise for. It's very difficult, very difficult. Zero sum, you know. Our politics are zero sum. You know, only 1.7% 1, 1. of the budget really favors poor people. It means that 98% of the budget favors rich people. Rich people. And so it's very difficult to be to, to find something to cheer the PPP about. If I can find something, I will. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, but it's very difficult, Brother Richard, from my side of the aisle, to find something that I can say to our supporters that this is something that you will benefit for benefit from. Not our old people who are getting $5,000. 
then you multiply, you divide, sorry, $5,000 by 31 or 30, 31 days of the month. You're talking about less than $2,000 per day is what they're getting. That's nothing to be excited about. Um, raising the tax threshold from 75,000 to 85,000. It's hard to shout about that. In the first place, people should not be earning 85,000 and $75,000 a month in Guyana. That's nothing. That's nothing. Can the president live off of $85,000? Can cabinet members live off of $85,000? No. That is small change to them. That's, that's not even their perks. But they put in a budget that people must live on that. I asked Elsa no last night, those of you who were on, what a living wage would look like or should look like. And he said it's closer to $200,000 at a minimum. And that's a minimum $200,000. That a living wage, given the economic situation in our country, a living wage should look more like $300,000 at a minimum. Because that $200,000 was last year figure. So here we are, brothers and sisters, struggling the struggle and seeing how unfair this government has been. How unfair. It's unfair. The level of inequality is, is terrible. Terrible. When you bear in mind, you bear in mind, when you bear in mind the amount of money that this government is getting, and you bear in mind the level, the level of poverty pegged as 48% by the IVB. And we understand it may be higher than that. Poverty. How can you have that level of poverty in the face of the wealth that is coming into the country, the money? that is coming into this country. Where is the money going? Is the government serious about dealing with questions of poverty? Is the government serious about dealing with poverty? Does the government want to wipe poverty off the face, you know? It is the single most important impediment to development, poverty. And that is why when we saw the government um, mowing down people's houses, taking away their property, their land. Those people who have been fighting to get themselves out of poverty and the government goes in and fights them down, bulldoze their homes, Take away their land. I give you all the story just now of how the government of the United States in 1830 took away the land from the native Indians and gave them to poor white men. That is what we are looking at in Guyana. Were they taking away that land from Mocha and give it to? Who are they giving those lands to? Who are they giving the lands? To? It's our own removal. There's no law yet, but they're doing it under I mean, I mean, in domain where which gives the government the right 
to take private property for public use. So it's our removal. We can call it the African removal. We saw it in Amelia's ward. We see it moving people's stands in Georgetown. We saw it in Moto. It's the Guyanese version of removal. It is what we can call African removal. Those lands in the United States were ancestral lands, Indian ancestral lands, taken away. Because the government of the United States wanted to expand and develop. And they felt that native Indians did not have the capacity to use the land. And so they took the lands away and shifted those Indians westward in what's called the Trail of Tears. We have our own Trail of Tears in Guyana. As you remove people from Mocha and you're sending them on the highway, from Mocha to the highway, the Trail of Tears, moving people from in front of the hospital to nowhere, the Trail of Tears, removing people <clears throat> from where they were in Amelia's ward and sending them to wherever they send them, the trail of tears because we are bawling, we are crying. We are wailing. The trail of tears, the removal of people from their birthright, their ancestral land. In modern Guyana, this is happening. Modern Guyana. Modern Guyana. Eminent domain may be applicable to some places, American, wherever. But in Guyana, where ethnicity and land are sensitive, sensitive issues, if you were the government, you want to tiptoe. You want to avoid. And we heard the president yesterday, I think I read in the media last night, that the president has gone out to the highway and threatened to bulldoze people on the highway. Threatening to bulldoze people on the highway. This is the bulldoze president. President Bulldozer. The man got through with bulldozing at, 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 at Moko. And he has gone on the highway now and threatening people to bulldoze them if they don't move and go where the government wants to take them. The trail of tears. I hope we see what's happening in our country. I hope we are taking note about what's happening in our country. And I hope that we are prepared to punish this government for what it is doing. I'm of the view that the official opposition should have at least make a symbolic showing of protest. It didn't. The opposition leader explains why it didn't. But I hope, I hope that at some point, this government is made to pay for that action. At some point, there's no statute of limitations when it comes to punishing governments for inhuman acts. And this government must be punished. Of course, they can be punished at the ballot box, but the ballot box is not the only way to punish this government. 
We have to begin to shun this government. I have taken a hands-off approach to the government going into communities that are not part of its base. And I have said it's the right of the government to go into these communities. And it's the right of people in the communities to welcome the government if they feel so. But in the face of what the government has done, look at what it has done. It went into Mako, sweet talk the people, lowered 28 of those families to take a pittance. They now will realize that it's a pittance because they're giving up land that is valued at a hundred times more than what they were given. They lower those people. Some of those people welcome them and cheer them. And then they waited and they send bulldozers against the others. So they give you what appears to be some niceness with one hand, and then they send the bulldozer afterwards. I hope people in the African Guyanese communities are seeing. And we have to ask ourselves in that community if that's the way we want to live. If we want to live as enslaved people, because that's the epitome of slavery. You feel you can sweet talk people, give them far less than their worth. And when some say that they are not taking it because it's far less, you bulldoze them. That's slavery. That's the epitome of slavery. That's present day slavery. And if the government is prepared to govern via policies reminiscent of slavery, then we in the African Guyanese community and our friends, our friends in the other ethnic communities, we have to decide whether that's all we want to live. I for one that African Guyanese or no ethnic group in Guyana should live like that. Not in 2022, 2023, no, no. So how do we prevent that from escalating? The president has given notice. He's going on the highway and he's going to do the same thing. The bulldozing president, that's how he wants to go down in history. The strong bulldozing president. Do we want to go down in history as victims of the bulldozing president? It is human to push back against inhumane action. It is human to push back against inhumane action. And I hope in our communities, in our political parties, we are beginning to plan to push back. I do not believe in command this leadership. I have had a running conversation with people who try to push me into becoming a substitute for people. And I reject that kind of politics. I do not believe leaders and parties should be substitute for people. Leaders and parties should inspire people, should guide people where necessary, but they should not become substitutes for the people. Leaders have to lead people, but people have to 
give them the mandate to lead them. I know that in times of trouble, in times of frustration, we tend to expect the leaders to step in and do it for us. And that is understandable. After all, these are the leaders we vote for. In particular, 200 and something thousand votes to the coalition. And we expect that they will lead us, but we have to define leadership. And leadership cannot mean dictating to people what to do. And so we have to develop a new kind of leadership praxis in our communities. Our leaders have to go into the communities and we have to organize with those communities to defend themselves. We have not done that in, in Mokko. And the Mokko issue has been going on for a long time. We have time in Mokko to plan a strategy. Maybe we didn't expect the government to be so extreme in its action. Maybe that's where we got caught. But we saw what happened in Linden. We saw what happened in Georgetown. Although the Georgetown thing was shortly before Mocker. We end up looking at night with a flambeau or fire stick, what we could have seen during it. This government is vicious. This government is vicious. I agree with opposition leader Norton that this government will shoot at protesters. Am I saying that to say that we should not go on the street and protest? No. But we have a government that is prepared to kill African Guyanese because the world view of individuals in the government, it seems, is one that attaches different value to some lives than it has attached to other lives. It's not an accident that African people are poor, as we like to say. Indian people are poor, as we like to say. Amerindian people are poor. Yes, we like to say that. It's not just black people who are poor. Amerindian people are poor. Indian Guyanese people are poor. But the Indian poor and the Amerindian poor don't have to worry that their sons and their fathers would be condoned by the police like they did to Mr. Boston, like they did to Peter Headley, like they did to Quindon Bacchus. I'm not saying that the police will shoot Indian people or they don't shoot Amerindian people but not in the same way that they shoot black people. So yes, we are all poor, but we experience that poverty differently. On top of economic poverty, African lives are constantly taken away indiscriminately by the government. We experience poverty differently. The Indian sugar workers or the sugar workers who are mostly Indian, they got $250,000 relief. The fisher folk got another big chunk. They are mostly Indian Guyanese. Indian poor. But the African poor were mainly in the public service. 
they got a mere eight percent. Mere eight percent, a couple thousand dollars. A couple thousand dollars. So we see, we see the discrimination. We see the inequality. Even among the poor, even among the poor, they're discriminated. So when we hear of politicians, especially the the the, the, the parliamentarians, you know, the, that those type the elected officials, they say, you know, the discrimination against African Guyanese. But it's also affecting Indian Guyanese and and, and I'm reading this blanket statement, you know, they make is a kind of politically correct statement you have to make because you don't want people to say you're racist. But you're lying. You're lying because, yes, this, the economic problems affect everybody, every poor person, every poor group. That is true. But in other areas, the right to life, the relief that is given to the poor, the relief is more to some ethnic poor than other ethnic poor. There's money in the budget for Amerindian development. I am in favor of that. But where is the money from? African development, because like Amerindians, Africans, and African poverty are historical. I understand why we have to help the Amerindians to develop, because they have been historically underdeveloped, but so are Africans. Where is the money in the budget for African development? I'm not saying there should not be money for Amerindian development. Yes, and they should get more. But where is the money for African development? A little pittance was given to it by the G in recognition of the United Nations. Recognition an admission that the African communities across the world still suffer from institutional racism, still suffer from institutional racism, which could come in the form of apartheid, could come in the form of segregation, could come in the form of inequality, so the United Nations has said that we are like the Amerindians. Yet there is nothing in the budget for African development. A little pittance given to it, Padre G, was taken away. So we are taking away money from Africans rather than giving money. From Where in the budget? Sisters and brothers, these are the facts of life in Guyana. They don't want us to talk about it, but we will continue to talk about it and to make our case so that when our people are ready to move, they're armed with an understanding of their own underdevelopment in Guyana. You know, there is a saying among our people these days that we talk too much. We have always talked. Jamaicans say, me mouth of me. Martin Carter said, the mouth is muzzled by the food it eats. And we have never been institutional, in an institutional way, muzzled. We in Guyana say,
that we have to speak up. I know frustration drives us in this thing, drive us to say where well, we mustn't talk and, and so on. Well, if there is no scope for action or there is no action and we stop talking, then we become less than human. We have to talk. Talking itself is action. Talking itself is action. We have to come to the narrative of the other side. I read in the Guyana Times where they say, we lost in Moko 28 to seven. They mean 28 people take their money and seven people who held out. And they say, we in the opposition have lost. 28-7, that's their narrative. That's their narrative. They're saying to black people, we know to pick you all off. We know to pick you all off. I don't care if there are black people who want to vote for the PPP or join the PPP or support the PPP. The people have a right to make their own political choice. But I have to tell them that what you're doing is voting and supporting your own oppression. Your own oppression. And you have to ask yourself whether that is the human thing to do. In a normal situation where political parties do not discriminate against particular ethnic groups, voting across the divide may not be such a bad thing. But if you're voting, if you're African Guyanese and you are voting or supporting the PPP at this particular juncture, you are party to your own oppression and underdevelopment. You are party to the de demolition of the homes at Moko. You are party to the murder of Quinton Bacchus, to the murder of Orrin Boston. You are party to the demolition of the homes in Linden. Good evening to you. We are expecting Mark to join us. I spoke with him earlier. He was in traffic and I heard the snow was coming down there in New York. Let's hope that he makes it home. He has not um, joined us yet, which means that he has not made it home. Those of you who are still out there and trying to make it home in the snow, be careful. Um, and um, Mark is usually um, on the ball, and since he's not here yet, we assume that he has not made it home. So sisters and brothers, we are living in serious times. As I was saying, if you decide at this time that you are going to support the PPP, then you are joining in, in the terrorization of your own community. Fear has always been real in Guyanese politics, as it is in politics in societies like ours. I've known that fear. There was fear when the PNC was in office. And there is fear when the PPP has been in office. And there is fear today. And we have to say to people that you cannot afford to make fear normative. Because what fear does is that it cripples you. Cripples you politically, cripples you as a human being. So many people call and say, Dr. Hines, um, 
so, 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 I give you so, so, but don't call me name. Fear, fear grips the land for good reason, for good reason. Many people are saying that the support base of the opposition is not coming out in the street out of fear. Fear of losing their jobs, fear of being killed. But when you become cowards in your own land, you are succumbing to oppression. When fear leads to cowardice, you are succumbing to oppression. And when a society succumbs to oppression, it dies. Are we African Guyanese? committing ourselves to social death again. Slavery was about social death. We were killed physically, but we also killed socially, social death. Orlando Patterson, our own Jamaican and Caribbean scholar, coined the term social death. And that social death that started in slavery continues to this day. Are we succumbing to our social death? Are we succumbing to social death? Are we saying that we are not going to fight social death? Are we saying we will only pray to God and leave everything to God's social death? Are we saying that we're gonna take the little small piece and shut up social death? A community and a society die when people refuse to act as human beings. Are we complicit in actualizing our social death? Social death. Look at the Palestinians. They fight and they have been fighting for decades and they continue to fight. They find creative ways to fight. I am sure they're fearful, but they're not consumed by their fear. They're not giving in to social death. They're not giving in to social death. I am not pessimistic about it. African Guyanese, I know that we will fight back. And I know when we begin to fight back, it will surprise even people among us. I know that. So I'm not one of those who believe that we will not never fight back. So what I'm doing here, is not cursing our people. What I'm doing here is encouraging our people to bring forward the agenda. We've seen enough. We've seen enough to tell us that one more year it will be closer to the point of no return. So, let's begin to plan. 
let's begin to plan what I call first self-defense, second, we have to plan how to capture power. If we're going to capture power by the ballot box, we have to begin to plan for that now. Because we are not going to capture power via the ballot box with the voters list that we have. We're not going to capture power by the ballot box when half of our people are so alienated that they may not even go out to vote. So the, there's no magic via the ballot box. We saw how the PPP tampered with the election long before election day. There's no magic via the ballot box. If we want to capture power as we must want, and the ballot box is the only medium, then we have to plan how we are going to turn the journey from here to the ballot box into a democratic journey. Look at what they're doing at GCOM. Hiring logistics officer and this officer and that officer, they're putting in place the rigging machinery and they're doing so with a 4-3 majority. So while we are talking about winning the next election, talking but not planning, not fighting, the other side is ensuring that it has the edge at the next election. It is beginning to rig the election from now. It is rigging the election right now with the machinations at GCOM. They are blocking every avenue that we have for getting power. People like myself have argued that at some point we have to make up our mind to share power in Guyana. How are we going to do it? We have to work that out, but we have to share power. That, but you, 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 the other side have to want, has to want to share power with you. The PPP doesn't want to share power. The PPP wants all the power on its own. And we have to be very careful that we're not begging the PPP to share power with them. Because it's not their power we are sharing. We are sharing Guyana's power. But they're very clear. They're signaling to us in no uncertain terms, we are not interested in sharing power. We want all the power or nothing. So even the power sharing thing that people like myself champion is not inevitable in this time. But power, we have to have. Without power, institutional power, the ability to determine who gets what, when, and how. The ability to get people to do things that, that may, they may not normally do. That's power. And at this point, all of that power resides in the hands of the PPP. And it is using it, using it against us, using it for itself, for its friends and for its support base. I am on record as saying to Indian Guyanese, can you not empathize with your African Guyanese brothers and sisters? 
I'm speaking there to their humanity, not their politics, their humanity. Are you allowing your politics to make you complicit with inhumanity? My appeal to the other ethnic groups, Amerindians and East Indians, is an appeal to your humanity. You, you can vote for the PPP, I don't have a problem with that, but where is your humanity? I think that you, your humanity is intact, but it's been compromised. If you cannot recognize that mowing down the homes of people of the other ethnic group is wrong, and you should say it's wrong, and you should say to your government it's wrong. My, my, my friend Richard, that I should be, I should be fair to the PPP where it deserves to be, to be applauded. And I should criticize them or take them to task where they don't deserve it. But, but, don't PPP supporters, should they not, should they not say to their government, it's wrong when they're wrong, when the government is wrong? Why are you seeking escape? as I notice a lot of my Indo-Guyanese brothers and sisters, seeking escape in some theorization that if you squat in, the government has the right to move you. You know, when the government changes, and invariably an African dominated government goes into power. My Indian Guyanese brothers and sisters, you all are gonna be where we are. I hope that African dominated government doesn't behave like the PPP. I hope they don't, they don't demolish your homes. I hope they don't give their ethnic group more than they give you. I hope these things don't happen. But revenge is the real thing in politics. You beat up people and they take government the, the next day. All they want is to beat you back. I hope our Indian Guyanese brothers and sisters are pondering that. Couldn't happen. But the likelihood of it happening is real. Must we live like that? Every time the government changes, it takes revenge on the other side. Clearly, this government feels it's taking revenge. Revenge for what? The coalition government had a lot of faults, but it didn't, it didn't go into Indian Guyanese communities and demolish their homes. It didn't give 200 and something thousand to sugar workers and give a pittance to public servants, it didn't. It made mistakes. But it wasn't an inhuman government, an inhumane government. It wasn't. I am not the one who, you know, goes out and say, we build five roads and the roads you build in now is we started. I, that's for the political party people. I don't get into that. Who build more homes and who build more roads? And I'm more concerned about who transformed the society and who didn't transform the society. But I can say, while the coalition government didn't transform the society, it didn't kill the society. It didn't use the power of the state to kill the spirit of the people, to take away their land, it didn't. But what is to stop 
a coalition government that comes to power in two years from doing exactly that. I hope they don't, because I don't believe in the politics of tit for tat. But when you beat up people as much as you're beating up our people, and they put pressure on us, when we get back in office to then beat up your people, what are we going to tell them? Well, I will tell them that I don't believe in the politics of revenge. They may chase me out of town. They may say I'm stupid. But the responsibility is also with the supporters of the government, especially the poor and the powerless. Because it is you all who will take the blows. It is you all who will become collateral damage if a new government goes down the road that this government is going. So we have serious work to do. We continue to have serious work to do. We have to do that work. We cannot be treated like animals and act like animals. We can't. We are a more dignified people than that. We are a more dignified people than that. So I'm gone for the weekend. I'll be back next week. And we will continue to cover. Um, hopefully, Mark will be able to join us on Tuesday. Um, but the work continues. Say good evening to Shara Duncan for me. And make your weekend a working weekend. Do something for the struggle. Do something for our struggle. Something. CLR James said there is always something to be done. Always something to be done.